All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special guest with me today. I'm not saying that just because I'm sleeping with him. He's very special. <laughs> hey, somebody needs to unmuse so we get a little yeah, feedback. We need to know. Alyssa's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> There it is. Hey, welcome Patreon people. We are live with our G42 class, uh, cybercasting in the village here. So we're going to do an interview about... Men. Men. We're doing an interview about men. Just okay. for you. So usually in our, our class, if we were all together, I would ask our men to answer these questions. But since it's kind of awkward and we're muted like one at a time, I'm going to ask this man... And then we're going to use the last hour where you guys can all respond and put your two cents in and, and we'll take our time with that. So there is a study that was done um, early 2000s and it was a survey of men and women ages 21 to 75 years of age. They were churchgoers, non-churchgoers, executives. They were every ethnicity you can imagine. They were, it was just well drawn out. Some were married, but most were in relationship. So I'm going to go through the questions that were asked of the men, and I'm going to give you guys the stats behind it, what the response was, and then we're going to ask Gary if he agrees with these. Oh, okay. Is that fair? More thumbs up. Okay. All right. So in this study, to understand how men think and women think, you there, babes? Um, the first question I have is the study said 72%, 74% of men would rather feel unloved than inadequate or disrespectful or disrespected by their woman. Would you agree or disagree? So 74% of men said they would rather feel unloved than, than, or in, than inadequate or disrespected. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, again, if if we're if we're not leading as men and our wives don't respect us, uh, they can't follow us. So that's number one. And Oscar and I just talked about this a little bit. Um, but then number two, as men, when we feel inadequate or we're not living up to something, that's kind of the worst thing because that was our whole life. We could never quite live up to our dads or to our coaches or to all of our things. And so when we feel inadequate, we get into shame and we get into all the different, all the uh, drives us to porn. It really is drives us to addictions to different things. Wow. Or inadequacies. How has that shown up in your life? Um, my, most of my life I felt inadequate um, and created a lot of insecurity, a lot of kind of being a yes man and wanting people to always wanting to please people. Really? Yeah. So like my first kind of big pastor who was one of my heroes um, of the faith that ended up not being one at all. Um, I just wanted his attention all the time. I wanted him to always see me, that kind of thing. You want his approval? Yep. Okay, so does that affect you more deeply in an intimate relationship with a woman? Does what affect does, you? Does, does feeling adequate or inadequate oh. or respected or loved, yeah. is that... What, okay, let me put it this way. Would it be fair to say that... If you felt kind of beat up at work or in the world or in your career or in your ministry, what would you want to come home to in a wife? Well, so yeah. So, I mean, I've lived this personally. So my first marriage, I was totally inadequate, could never live up. Nothing was ever good or right. Uh, didn't matter what the car was, the house was, didn't matter anything. It was never good. Um, and with you, everything is good. Aww. Oh, it's true. I mean, you... You speak life. You bring encouragement. Now you get nasty and mean. I am nasty. And she and does mean. drop the f bomb when she fights with me. Only if he's misbehaving. Um, and uh, but it's I if I know I'm had if I've had a really bad day of work or ministry or something, and I'm coming home to a wife who's gonna love and encourage me, it changes everything. I can I can put up with the bad days coming home. Now the other way around, Proverbs is really clear. It's like I'd. Rather live on the corner of the roof than with a, a wife that's like a faucet dripping all day long on me. Um, and so you, if, if you can't, I don't know how you would have really bad days at work and a horrible marriage. It just, it, it just doesn't work. We know men like that though that seem to survive. Well, yeah, and I survived. Yeah. I mean, you do what you have to do, but it doesn't make for a very happy life. No. No. Okay. So now that you're, how old are you? 53. 53. Now that you're 53. 
what would you, if you had to choose between a peaceful home life or your career dream, meaning being the Broncos personal pastor. Chaplain of the Broncos. Chaplain of the Broncos yes. with a big salary and all that. Yeah. Or a peaceful home life. What would you pick? <laughs> I hope you get both. <laughs> it's always both and, right? I, I, hope I want you both. Get both. No, I actually am living my dream, <laughs> my dream job. This is what I was put on the planet to do. Yeah. Uh, no question. And I have an amazing, peaceful, beautiful home. That's awesome. So it's always both and that you're striving for, but I'd rather have a peaceful home than anything else. Okay. Yes. That's awesome. Because the best way that you'll ever parent your children is by having a good marriage, period. You'll never be good at parenting. You'll never be the perfect parent. Your kids are going to be, I hope, as bad as mine have been. I hope my children are watching. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I don't wish that on you at all. But it, it's really tough being a parent, and you don't know that until you become one. And the best way we can parent is by loving our spouse really, really well, period. Excellent. Okay. Do you think that women show disrespect to men and don't even realize that they're doing it? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. What would be an example of that that you've experienced? How women show disrespect to men. Or make a man, or a man might feel disrespected by something a woman does or says. Can you, can, does a woman have power over you if she doesn't matter to you? No. Okay. No. And okay. I think now I would say a woman who d dresses un inappropriately, a woman who forces herself or pushes herself um, because of her insecurity, oh. to me that is a, that would show disrespect. Oh. Yeah. Disrespect to you? Uh huh. Disrespect to me and herself. Wow. That's a very, that's a mature man's take. Okay. I would think a, a younger, immature man a young, or boy would say that women disrespect by like the things that they say or cutting a man down, but that's like super obvious and you went to a much deeper, more beautiful place. Well, yeah. I mean, if a woman's just bitchy and cutting you down all the time, you're not going to respect her. And if she's just always constantly cutting herself down and everyone else, you just, you, there's, it's almost impossible to respect that. Oh. Wow. But when they when they're when they don't respect themselves, it feels disrespectful. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Okay. Is it confusing to you at all to hear that a woman would rather be loved than respected? No. Now the other way around it would, but a woman wants to be loved. Men want to be respected. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Anybody get that? You men agree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are we are we boring you that bad? Remember, guys, I'm an eight. I need feedback. You gotta do the way to shout it with her. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you can hear our sarcastic interns. They're beautiful. Okay. Um. What? Okay. Um. 60 or 76 <laughs> percent makes fun of my dyslexia all the time. Six, 70, I saw 67. Okay, it's 76, babe. 76 percent of men said they're not always confident as they look. Wait, parentheses. Men are hiding a sense of deep self doubt. The idea of failing is excruciating to men. Men want to be seen as successful, competent, and men feel what they do is always being judged or watched. While the cry of a woman's heart is, am I lovable? The secret cry of a man's heart is, do I measure up? Absolutely. You agree 100%, with that? 100%, yep. 100%. Okay. Again, it goes back to the way we're fathered, the way we're coached, the way our teachers are, the way we date. I mean, it's we're always trying to live a facade. Um, I mean, I think like James, the first semester, when he confessed that day of just being a facade and, and the lies. And that's true for most of us. Um, because of our insecurities and the way we've been raised, we, uh, we definitely fake it and usually don't make it. So, Do you feel like men are under a great deal of pressure to um, always have the answer and always know what to do next? And Absolutely. I, for the first time in my life, 
in the last couple of years is the first time I could say, I don't know and be okay with that. Oh. Yeah. There's never been a time until now that I, I'm at peace with myself and who I am and, and the ministry we're doing and the people where I can say, when somebody asks me a question, I don't know, I'm really happy to say, I don't know. Wow. That's yeah. freeing. And that's when the revelation came to me. The older I get, the less I know because the, the God keeps broadening and, and mystery keeps broadening. And the older I get, the less I know. And I'm really good with that. How would you parent your boys, your four sons differently with the wisdom that you have now of what it means to like truly grow into manhood for yourself? Oh. And you've been through a series of traumatic events. You've humbled yourself. You're a really, really good man. You're a faithful man. You're, you have a lot of integrity. You're honest and true and fun and all those things. I know he loves this. His, his, his. Keep his, saying his it. Language. What's it say? Oh, it's getting hot here. It's getting hot here. So that's who we you. We may have to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's who you have become <laughs> by choice. By choice, yeah. because you could have gone any other way. You sure. could have gotten bitter, angry, gone into like numbing yourself or whatever. Right. Now that you're on this side of manhood as a grandfather and having adult sons, how would you tell these young men to father their sons? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, I, I saw a great video the other day. It was a dad with his son like a four-year-old on the soccer field and the four-year-old's picking a flower and the dad is going nuts like son get up go after the ball what are you doing and the grandfather's standing there and he literally runs out and asks the the, the boy what kind of flower it was <laughs> and and i think is if we could get that as young men that we don't need to live vicariously through our children that we don't need the, them to be some kind of superstar in something so that makes us feel better as yeah. a father because it's our pride. Um, that would be, I would compare it completely different. Okay. I'd be much more gentle. I'd be much more not, uh, it's, uh, this book Unpunishable is really changing my life, but it, I, I wouldn't be a punitive or a punishable father. I would, I would bring life and substance to discipline. And again, I, I, I am still, I, I feel like spankings are righteous uh, not when they're abuse. I feel like um, discipline is very necessary, but I think we we do it out of our pride and our insecurity and our ego instead of out of life and empowerment and trying to make that person really, really great. Um, we just messed it up and had it turned around on us. But again, most dads don't know this stuff. Right. No, Nobody's fathering anybody. There are no, there are no masters out there who are discipling young men how to become awesome right. fathers. Right. And so... We don't know this. Your dads probably didn't know this. And so we've got a lot of grace and a lot of forgiveness. And, you know, I'm writing a book right now. In fact, you guys, I'm writing my book. While He's we're... actually really doing it. And, um, and I think it's pretty good. But I'm just going through when God would reveal his father heart through my dad. And my dad didn't know it. And I didn't know it. And um, it's kind of a dual thing. I call it the death of a boy. So it's my son that actually died. But then also the boy that had to die in me. And the, and God using my my angry father um, as a, as the father heart of God mm -hmm. through that process and so so anyway yeah good answer very good answer thank you yeah so when the when the boys were little and they were playing football and Michael would be running and you'd be on the sidelines screaming at him and one time when he was six he literally turned with his little helmet on on our face he goes Dad. I'm doing the best I can. And it was Stop. a moment no. of him expressing himself. Did that hit you? That Yeah, it did. It hit me in the moment. And they probably did it a few times. I remember <laughs> Caleb on the basketball court and yeah. Caleb uh, wouldn't look over. I was a very excited coach and I and I coached, you know, years and years and years of football, basketball, coached uh, the girls in softball. I taught them how to squash the bug to, to hit the bat. But I was intense and passionate. Um, and so, yeah, it hit me then, but it didn't mean near as much as it means now. Okay. Yeah. Did you feel that way when you were a little boy? I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Did you feel that way when you were, uh, my heater broke. Did I feel what way? Did you feel like you wanted to scream at your dad, I'm doing the best I can? I, yeah, and I did, finally. But yeah, absolutely, of course. Okay. All I think, right. I think all young, most young boys feel that way. Okay, good answer, Gary Black. Thank you. You're doing Mrs. really Black. well being a man. Um, okay, next question. Here's, first of all, a statement. Men 
are thinkers. When a man checks out, he's actually checking in. Men address issues by first pulling away to process and to think about how they can better talk about them later. Women process while they talk. Men many times need to disengage to figure out what it is they need to say. Men generally process one thing at a time. Yes. Can you focus on one thing I said? <laughs> Tell me what to do. do you uh, agree with that? I agree 100%. Um, and so what we'll learn and what I'm learning is what, when you learn to live from your heart and not your head, you actually can listen and respond the way God wants you to respond instead, instead of the way you want to respond. Oh. So I can, I can ask for forgiveness for, from you when we're in a fight and I know it's your fault. <laughs> and most of the time it is um, very quickly because I don't need to be right. And I do want peace and I want us getting along and empowering one another um, and I could have never done that and unless I was living out of my heart. Okay. I could never do that. Because God literally drops driplets from heaven of wisdom and understanding. Proverbs says, right, that, that wisdom and understanding come from our heart, not our head. So if we just have knowledge and we're trying to beat somebody in an argument or, or prove our, that we're right and they're wrong uh, and we're in religion, then we completely miss the whole point mm -hmm. of the relationship. When we can live in our heart and allow wisdom and understanding to respond, then I'm not reacting and trying to fight. I'm trying to respond from a place of compassion and love. Mm. Does that make sense? That's awesome. Okay. Okay, so how can a woman, these these young women here are in a situation where they're surrounded by brothers, that some they know really well, some they're getting to know. Mm -hmm. Some are married. Maya is a married woman, and I am a married woman, and all these women are going to be married soon. How can we tell the difference? Because you and Andrew say a lot of things like, "Don't men don't go silent," and um, but at the same time, I'm telling them like you need to allow men to have time to process what they're thinking without chasing them down. What's the difference between a man pulling away to process and a man going into a cave or a man going silent for the rest of his life? It's That's been a question. Uh, number one, awareness. Because most men don't know they do that until somebody shows them that they are doing that. Um, and then number two, I would say, is that once I'm aware, uh, then I have to make a choice. Am I doing this to avoid? Am I doing this because of my ego? Because I know I'm off here. You know, what's, what's my motive behind this? And then, now, and I will say this, ladies, you've got to have discussion. It's, Oscar and I just talked about this. You, you've got to have really good, hard discussions about what do we value in family? What do we value in how we're gonna raise our children? What are those things that are the most important to me in a relationship? Because I don't want, I don't want you surprised mm. when, I, when you're like, I didn't know this about or you. Or disappointed. Like, no, there's, there's no way that can't happen. And, and I wanna say this so I don't forget, it takes three years to get to know somebody. Okay, so you can't know, know somebody in a month or even two years. It takes three years to really get to know somebody. So uh, we marry a lot of people out of G42, as you know. There's some that I'm glad we're not right now. Um, and they always come back to us. In fact, we just had two of them come back to us. We don't use any names. In the last couple of weeks and said, I, you were right. I really don't know this person. I married them. I, I thought I was totally in love. And, and then what we always say is, well, you're already in, it's done, you're in covenant, so you get to learn this person, and you both get to learn and study one another. And the best thing that I've ever learned how to do is to study your rhythms and your pace. It took a while. It took a very long time. Because you were frustrated with my rhythms and my pace. Yep. You really wanted me to be more like you. Yep. And then I almost died. Yep. And then you realized that I couldn't be like you. Yes. I was literally created completely different. Right. Now I celebrate that she's an introvert. And like after this week, now it's unusual because we're locked up and we're not going anywhere, but I would put her away for a few days and I'll bring her tea and I'll bring her her toast and not let anybody come near her because I know as her introvert self, she needs that time to, to fill back up. And so, and Jesus was an introvert. I, I heard you say it yesterday, I think, that he always went to the lonely place so he could fill back up and then reattach himself to the pain of the city and so the point in that is that you've got to study one another's rhythms mm -hmm. you have to study one another's pace what what brings life to my spouse and how do i re-energize them so they can plug back in or serve that at least 
Um, and I, I would have never known that. Nobody ever told me that. We just had to figure it out the hard way. So your world, you you are definitely extroverted. By the way, I love people. Love, love, oh, yeah. love of people. Course. We know. No, yeah. but I mean, that was one of the issues that came up early in our marriage is you were like, why don't you like people? And I'm like, I love people. I just have to fill back up. So one of the things I was studying last week is how I can come visit you in your world because I value you. And so I go do the things that you, you want to do, but then I have to go fill up somewhere else. And you can come visit me in my introverted world, but you have to go somewhere else and fill up. And so we have to release each other to be able to do that. Absolutely. And do you think most people marry someone usually that's opposite than them? Yes. Why do you think we do that? <laughs> because, we, well, I don't think we do that on purpose. I think we do. Really? Yeah, I think we know that we need some balance somewhere. Like, I needed you to, like, challenge me and bring more adventure into my life. That was what I was attracted to about you. Like, you were so fearless. And I was like, I, I want more of that in my life. I'm kind of bored. And you definitely shook that up. And I think you needed some calm in your life. And I think that was one of the things you were attracted to me is like, I, I had a peaceful demeanor about me and my home was peaceful. And your boys, when you guys would come visit, like it was, there was peace there. And I think you were, you, all of you were looking for peace. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But then we could have spent the rest of our marriage where I was trying to make you like me and you were trying to make me like you. And right. we probably would hate each other. Yeah. And I, I would say what's really important, especially for men. And the reason why Andrew and I are so adamant about find your voice as a man is that when we don't, when we go silent, then our women don't respect us. And they don't even know consciously that they're losing respect for us. But they lose respect and then they have to get into control and start leading the family, which they're not supposed to lead alone. We're supposed to lead together. But women get in control and manipulation and bitterness because the, it's out of balance because the man's gone silent. Mm -hmm. Usually is this how it works. And so what I want to always do is make sure... That, that she's rested and she's full of life and that I'm serving that first because that's my job. When Jesus said, you know, the head of the church, that the man is the head of, the, of, the, of his wife, all he meant was you get to study her and come underneath her and make her better and find out what, what brings life to her. That's what that means. That's what that headship means. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really important to be able to know that we're different and then celebrate the differences and then come together in those. So one of the questions that came up was, could we have avoided a lot of the pain in our marriage had we gone in with the knowledge that we have now? Oh, so much pain. Now, you still have to fight, guys. It's not bad to fight. We get into some fights, and I told you she'll drop the... I That's mean, she not comes. true. It I is told you so not to true. say oh, that yeah. anymore. I'm sorry. It's true, but I, I'm not supposed to say it anymore. It's um, not true. I <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway um, no, it's okay to fight. It's not a bad thing. And we're fighting right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because again, conflict always done what right creates intimacy. And so, but what's bad is when you hold on to it and when you start to let it grow bitterness and when you start to let it grow and fester, which I refuse to do now. I know you're good. At and that. so it's just like, uh, I know as a man, if I let that grow I, now, sometimes I just need to go on a drive or I just need to go on a hike and get out. That's the way that I reconnect to myself. Or go, and, see, go see a movie by yourself. Yeah, or I'll go that. see a movie by myself, which I love. Um, and I don't know that I've done that in a couple of years. No, because there's never any English speaking. Uh, yeah. That was my next question. Okay. Is why do men enjoy slash need mindless activities? Because we're mindless creatures. <laughs> That's not what Hello? I mean. That's not true. Like when, honestly, it, sometimes women, I mean, Maya, you can attest to this, I'm sure. I see you looking at your beautiful husband right now. If, if we're sitting there and, and you're like, what are you thinking? And we say nothing. That's true. Sometimes. I know we talked about that this morning. You did. It's so hard for us to understand. We know you're not lying. We just can't like, we can't even imagine what that's like. So, so did you talk about, so, you know, as a man, if we look at a, a, a somebody's grades and it's up on a board and it says A, 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 B, F, B, A, we go, Hey, mostly A's. Awesome. A woman focuses on the F. <laughs> you got the F. And then and and then when you look at a man's brain, it just goes from this line to this line. A woman's brain is scrambled everywhere. Everything's connected. Because every single thing's connected. This is why, guys, you don't talk about your if you had sexual relationships before your marriage, you don't need to talk about those things. You don't need to tell each other everything. That's the worst thing you can do. 
I've got a lot of alumni, World Race and G42 guys who get married and they tell their wife they're struggling with porn. And then their wife loses her mind and they're about ready to get divorced. And here's what I always tell them. And I'm telling you guys this right now. Uh, do not tell your wife you're struggling with porn. That's ridiculous. She doesn't want to know it, first of all. Second of all, she has no idea where to put it. Because women, their brains are connected to everything. And in 10 years, you'll get in an argument and she'll remind you that you were addicted to porn 10 years ago. Somehow they remember every detail and what shirt you were wearing and everything what that was happening. What song was on the radio. <laughs> it's true. So what I tell them is you let her know that you're in accountability with me. That I'm asking you every week, what's your porn like? What's your porn addiction like? What, what are you doing in your life? What do those things look like? And if a woman knows that a man is in accountability with a man of God, of wisdom and strength, that's going to hold them to their stuff, that's all she needs to know. Right. And so that's really important. I know you've probably been taught different and I know some of you aren't agreeing with me right now. I don't care if you want a healthy tr <laughs> marriage and a healthy where your kids look at your, your marriage and say, I want to have the same kind of marriage that my parents had. I don't know that I've ever heard that at G42 from a, from a student. Hey, Gary. Yes. Um, you think that's healthy to not share with your spouse what's actually going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't tell them everything. No, absolutely not. No, you're not hiding it. Absolutely. You're not hiding anything from each other, but you're not going into detail with one another. You're in accountability and discipleship with another man or another woman, and you're having those healthy conversations. If they know that's true and that's happening, they don't need to know every detail. That makes sense? Yeah. And I know you guys, I know you, I know you. Okay. Also, not true. I look up, but I look at grades and I see A's because I'm <laughs> optimistic. Okay. And it's Lenny, crazy. and she says she sees all A's like men do because she does have a bit of more of a, a man's mind. I appreciate that. Lenny, listen to me though. On, I know your whole generation has been told that you need to tell each other everything, and I'm just telling you it's not true. And I want to encourage you strongly. <clears throat> to always being in a, in a really strong, safe discipleship, mentorship, relationship that you're able to talk about all of these things about too. And that and that your spouse knows that, that you're in accountability. Lisa knows that she can go to Andrew and Seth to, about anything with me. If I'm struggling with anything or doing something or, or anything at all, she knows she can go straight to Andrew and Seth and they'll deal with me every single time. And I want that kind of accountability and relationship in my life. Just to say, to say to your spouse that you're in accountability is bull crap. Accountability is not true. I can skirt around accountability all day long. To, to, for your spouse to know the person that you're in accountability with, to know that they're men and women of integrity and of life, and that they will come to you and they will take care of it, that's the point of accountability. Cool? Yeah. Okay, let me also say on that point, just to clarify, that... Um, I can pick up Gary's phone or use his computer at any time. He can do the same with mine. We know each other's passcodes. We have the same bank account. We know how much he knows how much I spent at H and M, and um, he, we know everything. And if there was ever a time where I went to get his phone and he pulled away from me, I'd be like, "What's up? Like, what don't you want me to see?" And that would set off an alarm with me that something's going on. So we have full disclosure in this relationship. Absolutely. And I would be very nervous if I was a young man or a young woman and I was get in a in a intimate relationship with someone and I did not have access to all their social media and everything that they did. Like every time you see a married couple and they have to share a Facebook, you're like, who cheated? You know? Like why why does why do they have to have the same Facebook? Because they have to read every message, they have to read everything. Well then sometimes it it did happen. People cheated yeah. and they do need that accountability with one another. And and what I said, Lisa has all my passcodes. She can go on anything. Now we're not smart enough to figure out if you can get around that stuff technology wise. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty safe too, actually. Um, but I, I, I've, I see it a lot of times in, in, in relationships and I would say we don't like Andrew teaches. We don't really, we're not dating just to date somebody. If I'm, if I'm going to go into a courting or dating relationship, my intention is at your age and what you're doing is that we're going somewhere with this relationship. 
And if you're not in that same space, we probably shouldn't even waste our time, right? And even in that kind of relationship, as it's progressing and getting strong and you know God's doing something, man, I don't want to hide anything from anybody, but I'm not going to t- tell you everything about my life that's going to make you not respect me. I'm going to let you know that I have a- accountability in my life with-, with people that you're going to meet. And in fact, young men, I'll tell you this, I mean, I'll, I'll, hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, of young women tell their the, the person that they're seeing that they have to come see me and Andrew before They'll even consider dating them or getting married to them. And a, a gentleman that came out of uh, G42, he's an incredible man, came, flew here to Spain just to ask me if he could get a promise ring for my daughter. But he wanted my permission first before he would even present it to her. That's the kind of man you're looking for, ladies. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of men that you want. Mm-hmm. Amen? And when we were first married and you did not have brothers, you had drinking buddies. Yeah. I did not feel secure in our relationship. That's true. When you were out with your drinking buddies, I didn't trust you. Right. But over time, as you developed <clears throat> real brotherhood, friendships, and relationships with men that I knew wanted you to succeed, wanted me to succeed, and wanted our marriage to succeed. Because I think your friends, when we met, would have encouraged you to cheat on me. They would have thought it was hilarious, yeah. and they would have covered for you or whatever. But the men that you have surrounding you now as a mature man and a good friend that you are would never allow that. That's and right. they would be on it before I would even know it was happening. And so that's a completely different situation. So that the trust in the relationships that have come out of time in your friendships and my friendships, like you know some of my friends, they back you up. A hundred percent. They want our marriage to succeed. They're not just on Team Lisa. Right. So what he's saying is if he did, if he was struggling with something, he would go to those guys first to, to clean it up and take care of it, not to hide it from me. So if I don't need to be involved in that conversation, you don't he, want to I don't want to be. I really don't. I, because I mm-hmm. trust him. I trust the integrity of his heart. But we've been together for 20 years. That didn't just happen overnight. It didn't happen because we were soulmates. It happens because we've been through a lot with each other and we know, and I did the same thing with our kids. If my kids came to me and said, I want to tell you something, mom, but I don't want dad to know. I would say, okay, well, you know, I will listen to you, but then I have to decide what dad needs to be brought into. And then I would go to him and say, I'm Michael shared something with me and I'm dealing with it with him. I think we've got it under control. I'll let you know if I need you. And he'd say, okay, like he trusted me to mother our children and I had a trust relationship with them, and it and it was good. I think it was, a, and, you, and you didn't want to hear all the little no. itty bitty things that were happening in no, the house. I did not. That was my do. Okay. Do we have a question there at the house? Yes, sir. Uh, Franklin. So I think what you were getting at is just kind of like there's just certain things that you don't talk about if you're like there's certain things you're going to talk about with Seth and Andrew yeah we can talk about anything what i'll always say to her is if she's in fear or if she is trying to control right and she's asking me questions that i know are going to backfire and not go well i'll ask her do you really want to know the answer to that or are you okay okay that i'm talking to andrew about that right now and you can t- you can ask andrew if you if him and i are having this conversation then she'll always say no i don't need to know right <laughs> But if I'm out with a bunch of my drinking buddies and they're all trying to, they're on team Gary and they're trying to hide stuff from me, that, I can't even have that conversation, right? Right. That's why, that's why we get met healthy men and women in our life. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, sir. I know, I, I, I know this is going to be a struggle for you guys. So I'm glad I have my seniors there to back me up. Come on. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give an example just very quickly while we're on this is we had a couple that was, um, that we've been in their life for 15 years now and we did their marriage counseling and walked them through their dating and everything. And he had had a very, very lively sex life pre Jesus and pre meeting this little girl. This little girl was a virgin on our wedding night and had only served the Lord of her life and never had done like anything wild. And he's like, I'm going to tell her everything. And I said, don't. And he said, I, Mama Black, I'm going to tell her everything. I said, please don't. He said, I'm going to tell her who I slept with, when I slept with them, how many times I slept with them, how great it was, how great her boobs were, blah, 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 blah. I said, don't do it. This couple is still in constant 
torment. They can't stand each other. And I said, listen, I can tell you what's going to happen is when she is home with your babies washing the floor, all those memories are going to come flooding back into her head. And the enemy is going to use that and is going to bring bitterness and anger because she waited and you didn't. And now she has the details and the color. And that's exactly what's happened. And they are not peacefully married. Right. There is not affection and love between them. And I don't know if that was the root, but it certainly started there. Well, and if, <clears throat> yeah, if you're a true man of God, a true woman of God, and you can sin, you can struggle, but you're not a sinner anymore. You've been cleansed. You walk it by the blood of Jesus and the power of God. And then you mess up. It says, God says he doesn't even remember that when you come to him and confess and repent. So why would you want to keep reminding your spouse of that, that they can't let go of that? And Lisa's right. I know a lot of you ladies it would feel like you're supposed to go change the world. You're supposed to go hold orphans. And then all of a sudden you're now married and have three crying babies. And it's like, what am I doing with my life? When that is the actual best, most amazing thing you could do, I, I believe, with your life. Uh, is getting arrows ready to go into the nations um, and discipling your children. But those memories come flooding back. And I honestly, I can say this with my whole heart because I've asked God for this. I don't even remember what people did to me that hurt me. I had a lot of people do some really, and I've hurt people, but I don't remember all, all my past sin and my past mm -hmm. stuff. It's like God's just taken that and washed it away because he doesn't remember it. And so when we share those intimate details with one another and one spouse gets healed, but the other one's not, mm -hmm. and they start bringing those up again, it can't do anything but create conflict, period. Yeah. And I think a conversation of like, <clears throat> listen, I have a past. There's things I did. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did. And it's in the past and the Lord's forgiven me. And I hope you can forgive me. If you can, we can move forward. If you can't, we can't move forward. And I would just, I'm just talking about details. I just, you do not want to give a woman a bunch of details that are going to get messed up in her mind that the enemy is going to turn and use against her because he will look for that opportunity when she's tired, when she's angry, when she's, you know, overwhelmed or whatever, he will come in like a flood and you're going to walk in the door and she's going to blast you. And you're like, what did I do? That was 30 years ago. And you're thinking, well, I'm thinking about it right now. And it's really real to me right now. So it's just. It's just a, just a place where you guys really need to pray into about um, just being honest and open, but not giving detail. You don't and need to pray into it. Either have a really good, strong marriage or, or tell them everything and watch the struggle. It's just not that hard. There's some things we just don't need to pray about. It's like, hello. You see how somewhere in the middle is something really good? <laughs> it's true. I have a question. Of course you do. Well, Go. I have Okay, so we're talking, I think, I feel like specifically we've been talking like men to women. Do you also advise the same thing women to men? And also, like, what if there are things from the past that you have to work through as a married couple? How do you, like, handle that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm always talking about both, both and, right? It's always the woman and the man. Uh, I think if, if like, if a, if a good example is if you were a young woman and you were abused a few times by just ridiculous men, which happens all the time, right? You're going to bring that abuse into this relationship that God's ordaining. You need to be able to talk through that and say, I've been abused and I, here's how I react to that so that he's fully aware. And if, if that's not, if you, you don't want to get married until those things are settled, because if you carry those things in baggage into your marriage, it's just, marriage is hard, guys. Marriage is hard anyway. It's the most amazing, beautiful thing on the planet besides our relationship with the Father. But it's very, very hard on both sides. And when you bring a bunch of baggage in that you haven't dealt with and you think this guy's going to help you deal with it or this girl's going to help you deal with it, they can't. They don't have the ability to do that. Now you're in a covenant and you can't go anywhere. You know how many of my friends lived together for like 10 years and then they'd get married and they'd be divorced in six months? Because what, what they realize is, is, is living, they weren't, they weren't covenantal people. As soon as they made that covenant and they felt trapped, they, they were done with each other. They got divorced. And so as covenantal people, as covenant people, we want to, our responsibility before I get married to my spouse is to make sure I get healing in all these areas, and, or at least that I'm pursuing it with my whole heart. And of course, I bring my spouse into that space. But I, it, it, then if it's not being dealt with, then that's the only time I would recommend counseling. I'm not a big counseling guy only because most counselors don't know how to get to transformation. 
They, they mostly are trained how to keep you stuck so you keep coming back to them, in my experience and what I've seen in school and everywhere else. So if you, if you can find a rare counselor whose goal is to get you to transformation and healing so that you don't need to go see a counselor, those are the ones you, that I would go see. That's a good answer. Yeah, Amen. I just want to say, this is so good. <laughs> like, my heart is pounding just because, like, I'm just excited to, like, hear this all again. And, like, the advice that you guys are giving right now is such truth and so good and things that we don't hear as young people. Um, and I just, yeah, I just want to say, like, keep going and keep saying it. And, yeah, I think you guys are hitting every mark perfectly in here. You're hitting the perspectives because we're over here muted and we're asking each other questions through it and you guys are getting to it at the end and you're covering all your bases and it's just it's so good like this is like thousands of dollars of marriage counseling that we're getting to <laughs> yeah. hey hey i got a Thank foundation donations. come on baby <laughs> <laughs> we also take wine payment and like keep keep an open heart with what they're saying and let them get to the end of what their what their point is because I promise you at the end they're going to wrap it in a full circle and it's going to be beautiful and, and package perfect and you. So just continue having an open heart. I know this like topic especially can hit a lot of nerves and a lot of wounds and different things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just like, just rest for a second. Let them share, let them speak it out. And then you guys can, you know, ask your questions and Absolutely. You know, do all your things and, and kind of sort that through with other people or through yourself and the Lord. But yeah, just really have an open heart with this. This is really good stuff, you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. Okay. 71% of men said that the responsibility to provide is always on the back of their minds. Men have a deep and innate sense for the need to provide. Men's need to provide can weigh them down. And they kind of like it that way. They like the pressure. Yes, absolutely. I think part of where we failed your generation specifically is not putting enough responsibility on men's shoulder, young men's shoulders. I think every young man wants responsibility. Every young man wants to be slapped. They want to be <laughs> told who they are, grow up, carry the responsibility because it's what we were born for. Um, and again, that doesn't make us better or or anything than a woman because there's you women are going to carry such responsibility and some are going to make way more money than your spouses and all that is incredible and awesome and should happen right but as men we are born like we think about history we were born out of the garden to go to war i mean we were born outside of the garden in the wildness so we're wild natured at heart and then we were put in this garden and we blew that and, and we've been at war ever since. But we've got to be soul, we got to be have one minded because when I'm at war, I can't be thinking about my women and children, my wife and my children at home and what are they eating or not. I've got to finish fighting and then I can step out of that and then focus here. Right. So for me, it's in the spirit. When I'm in my quiet time, she knows this, I hate my quiet time disrupted because I'm at war. For my family, for you guys, for, for what God's doing on the planet. And I know that if I get messed up in that, I'm going to lose kind of my place and be done. So when I can finish that, then I can go focus on something else. Because that's just how God made us as men. And you are a very um, disciplined person, the way that you live your life. You work out your quiet time. Your, your, and if I ask you a question when you're in those modes your eyes flip a little bit and I'm like, whoop, wrong time to ask the question and talk to you later. You kind of look up at me like, can this not wait? And I'm like, well, actually I would, if, if I could tell you this, I could close that tab, which would make my day go easier. And until I tell you that I can't close that tab. So we've had to learn each other's rhythm. And I, in the morning, I try not to bother you. And then sometimes in the afternoon, I'm like, Hey, can sometimes I ask for a business meeting? Yes. I'm like, I just, there's like eight things on this list I need to ask you about, and then that's it. And then we can kind of move on. But right. we, it took us a while to find that rhythm. Yeah. And Lisa has to say to me, Gary, I need your full attention right now. I need you to put the phone down. 
I need you not to look anywhere else. And now I'm learning to live in the now much more in my life and, and being really focused on the person I'm talking to. What color are my eyes? They're, they're brilliantly blue. They're not blue, they're, they're green. green. I know. And, um, and I think it's really important that women, to, you need to be able to say that to, to the men. of like, hey, this is me now. And we know on our date night, phones away, distractions are gone. It's just us. And, um, but we've got to be really clear with that. We've got to be able to communicate about that. And that's okay to fight about it all the time is ridiculous, but to then come up with how we're going to do this and why is this so important to you? And then value that in each other is huge. Excellent, babe. Okay. Okay. Does that say 87? Yeah. It does. 87% of men say that images pop up in their heads without them doing anything. Men are wired to be visual. It's not personal, it's primal. There's a unique wiring in the male brain that creates an instinctive pull to visual, visually consume the image of an attractive woman. How did you teach our boys and yourself to appreciate the beauty of an attractive woman when she comes to... Because you're going to notice. Absolutely. If there were attractive men on the earth, I would notice them, but there's not very many. So I. There's a bunch of them out there. I know, but they're my sons. That's weird. I do notice them. I always tell them how handsome they are. But if there was an attractive man my age walked in the room, I would notice him. But what is that like for a man? And what did you teach our boys about how to be respectful of women and your wife and yourself? Okay. So um, when God looked at us and made us, he said it was really, really good. And I think he was talking about the women, of course. Um, <laughs> when when I see a really pretty woman, I did this when I was before I was married, and I did this with our sons. It's like you can always look once, and let's celebrate that. That is a gorgeous woman. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that woman. And now I get to look away. So I clap. I would drop books and just clap and say, "My Lord, you are gorgeous. Thank you that God made you." And then I look away, and I don't get to celebrate. So so for the, our sons. I always say we get one look. We can look once and that's it. So Noah on the beach here in Spain <laughs> oh with all the boobs everywhere for you new people who haven't experienced it yet, but there's boobs everywhere on the beach. Noah, a soccer ball got kicked over and hit this woman's breast that had no top on. And we made him go over and get it. And I just said out loud and the woman heard me, son, remember you get to look once, but then that's it. And it made him laugh and everybody else laugh. Uh, and it's true. So if I if I see a gorgeous woman, I'm going to acknowledge that. And then if I choose to look back a second time, then I'm making a wrong choice. Because that she's not mine to look on that way. Now, again, I'm not perfect in this, and there's no way to be. But that's that's how you live your I life. usually agree with you, though. I'm like, wow, she really is gorgeous. I wonder where she got her boots. Not boots. her boots. Boots. Not her boots. Okay. Her boots. I wonder if she got her boots. <laughs> I said boots. Yes. <laughs> that's for you, brother. <laughs> Okay, so is is looking once and appreciating someone's body or beauty lustful? No. Nope. How does it become lustful then? When we look back again. Okay. I want to want want more. Okay. Yeah, lust is I want more of something. When I when I can see something and then and that's enough, and I start I make the choice consistently it becomes a habit. Then the then I don't lust after something. Right. Temptation isn't sin. It's when we're when we allow temptations to grow in us because we're after it now. That's when it becomes sin. And when when we're out, you say that women, men don't look at me anymore, but women do. Like women actually are always looking at other women. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. I just women like stare each other down. Like I watch women stare my wife like head to toe. I'm always like, hello. I know it's because there's competition between women. <laughs> So that's why they, they're like, who does she think she is? Or what's up with her? So strange. Or, well, I know. I know. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I do miss men looking at me, though. That was such a... They hard... still I, look at you, I remember the day it stopped, and I was like, shoot. <laughs> Not true. They still do. And I usually say something to the men like, she's gorgeous, isn't she? Well, I used to. Okay. Wait, do we have a question? Wait, quick thing on... Yeah, yeah. Um, on, on that, I feel... Uh, so you said like, look once, it's fine. You look twice, it's less. Um, but then there's also, I feel like there's also the temptation, like looking once and then thinking about that person. Cause it's also like, 
looking once how, and then like not looking again and not thinking again like because isn't that isn't like thinking yeah, about absolutely. that person yes. or that image like the same thing just continuing to look back yes absolutely but again we're men and <laughs> most men aren't trained and so they're pigs most men are pigs, if we're honest. And so... This is why I let... He can say those things. I would never say those things. No. no. So what I have to do as a young man is I got to get around men. I Follow me as I follow Christ, right? I get. I got to follow men that I... I have never seen Andrew look twice at a woman. I've never seen Seth Barnes watch a woman's butt walk by a table. Seth avoids women altogether. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Except his wife. Yes. And so... I think those are the kind of men I'm going to surround myself with. If I'm with men that are lusting over people all the time, uh, that doesn't bode very well for me. Uh, you know, you're the average of the five people you hang around. And so for, for me, Jackson, I, I agree. Absolutely. I've got to, that's how you train yourself though. If I, if I don't know how to just stop looking, I'm not going to know how to just stop thinking as well. Right. I live myself into a new way of thinking. I don't think myself into a new way of living. So I've got to I've got to practice living righteously, and then my mind lines up with that from my heart, not the other way around. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Good. I think I think in addition to that, with the like live into a new way of thinking, like don't go to those places per se. You know, like don't go to. A, a club, let's say, and expect everybody to have a park and snow pants on. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, but but then like again, that. yeah, that's good. But if you're down at the on the beach, and you will be when this when we get out of lockdown, <laughs> and there are naked women everywhere, and some of them are 19 year old Norwegian women that are gorgeous, you you get to make a decision, and and that decision does determine then what your heart does. Am I going to let that get into my heart and, and create an emotion or something in me that's not healthy, or am I going to keep that clean? And so we're not always going to be able to protect that. That's good. Thank you, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, just because I know you like your heart on this, um, I think just to clarify, I know what you're saying. You're not saying that men who have like this one card in their wallet that you're like, hey, I get one free look at any woman that I want. But it's more of just like it's our natural instinct as a man is the, the attractive woman walks in the room that you're naturally going to look. But it's all about where your heart pocket is. Yeah, I, yeah, Andrew, thank you. And I, but I would say both and. I do want to celebrate beauty. <laughs> right. But like, you're, you're, what I'm saying is your heart on that's not like. Right. Just gonna, yeah, like, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Good clarity. I, I, it's not, I mean, if I'm not intentionally trying to find good looking women so I can look at them once. That's not my hard intention. <laughs> but when it happens, I have to be really honest with myself and with the Father. And if I do, which sometimes I can, look twice, then what do I do? I immediately confess that. And, and, then, I, and then I have to risk again. Like, I, I can still be okay. I can still see a beautiful woman and not look twice. But we're never, ever going to be perfect in that. Well, and I think a good example of that is a certain religions, and I won't say what they are, but they they force their women to cover their entire bodies with black material because they don't want to lust over women. And those are the most lustful men I have ever met on the earth. So, yes, we as women have a responsibility to make sure that we are not causing that issue. I mean... Noah called the other day and he's like, mom, I was talking to blah, blah, blah. And I could not believe how low cut her shirt was. And I wanted to say to her, like, go put a shirt on. You look ridiculous. And there's no way, like, where am I supposed to put my eyes? I'm trying to look you in the eye. But you are like, your boobs are hanging out of your shirt. And I was like, I know. I used to have a lot of clients that would come in and they were just like hanging out everywhere. And I would say to my male counselors, I was like, what do you guys do? I said, I can't even help but look at them. They're like, they're consuming the room. You know, we have... We have a responsibility how we dress and how we... I always ask you, is a skirt too short? Is that whatever? Absolutely. And what I wear for our dates are different than what I wear out for other people. But um, <laughs> but then I have to run into other people. So that's not good. That, that can backfire. Like, oh, that's a short skirt. But men are responsible for their thoughts. And they, you do have control over your thought life. 
And it may feel like a little war, but I do feel like that is one that if you practice that over time, you will you will get victory over Yeah, that. look, the tension's the point. The war is the point. Don't be afraid of tension. The whole New Testament is all tension. Jesus says, you're my brothers and sisters. And then he says, you know, you got to hate your mother and father. And you don't honor your dad and mom if you don't go help them in their old age. But leave your mother and father and go give your life. So there's always these tensions that we have to live in. He was always speaking both and. And the tension of you fighting through that is a good, healthy thing. That's not a bad thing. Don't make it this horribly bad thing. If you get addicted to looking and get addicted, then go get somebody to help you. But the point is to have fun with that, celebrate that a bit, and not get caught up in the in the the bad of it, the dark of it. Right? Amen. All right. Should we take a pee? Yeah. They, but there's yeah. there's a there's a performance that's happening oh. during intermission. Oh, uh, yes, babes. Real quick, um, <laughs> I just wanted to pick your brain on something. Hi. Hi. You just said something really nice, so don't get mean now. I'm not. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Processing and learning more about in my own life heart with that. Um, just because, like, over time, and, like, I learned a lot about men being around Kendall and Drew, and like, they're incredible. And it's like a lot of things to me, um, you know, and things like that. But that this specific topic actually, like, bothered me a lot while I was in Thailand. And I didn't really know what to do with it because I didn't really agree with the you can look once kind of thing. And I am getting to like learn more of the heart behind that and like the process behind that where you men are coming from and you're just like natural instincts and these things. But I think I just want to hear like Lisa, your side of things because I know as women, like it's already, there's already that, even if you're not aware of it, there's that little bit of competition in your mind when you walk into a room filled with women and if you have your man next to you and you see it, you, you can also recognize when you're the beautiful woman in the room. I right. do, yeah. Yeah. question is so i think the question is how do i handle the fact that i'm married to a real man <laughs> no i mean like he's a real man like he's like he's not he's not a saint like he's he notices attractive women like is that the yeah. question that was that came out wrong that came out like sarcastic i didn't mean that like <laughs> yeah I'm married to a real man and I really learned to appreciate that I don't want him to be anything other than a man. And I, I think that if he was unfaithful to me or he lied to me or betrayed me, this would be a different conversation, but he has not done those things. And I have the faith that he is not going to do. Things. But, but I have done those things. Early in our marriage, I, I did do those things. I did lie to her about stuff. And I did look at women way too long. And I did think about that. And so there, there, I, gave, I gave her every right to not trust me. And not even trust me now. But Lisa had to make the choice. Is Gary really becoming this man? And is he surrounding himself with proper people? Mm -hmm. And did she have to choose back into trusting me again? Mm -hmm. And so, and I, that goes both ways. That's for men and women. So it's... Yeah, and so I don't know how to quite answer. I'm not sure of the of the question, Elizabeth, but I think that men are just gonna men will look, and again, it's what do we do with that? Do we are we can we take captive every thought through our hearts and walk in purity in that? And the answer to that is yes and no. Sometimes we can't, and then we have to confess that and get right back to it. Um, and that's the kind of men you want. You don't want a perfect man because you're not going to find it. And you don't want a man who's 50. First of all, that's too old for you. But second of all, you're not going to marry a man who has figured a lot of things out that some 50-year-old or 60-year-olds have figured out. You're marrying a 20-something, 30-something young man who's still in the tension of learning these things. And so you get to learn those with him and have some grace there. Um, just make sure that he's surrounded with good men in his life. And, good, and you women are with good women. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to give the impression in any way that I am in denial or that my head is in the sand because I think you guys know that's, yeah, that's not, not who I am. No. I'm very aware we have real conversations and we have a very real marriage and we always have. So that was up to you what you said about how the beginning of our marriage was. But those things are in the past 
and those things are forgiven and he shows up every day and he's stay he's staying and I'm staying and we're staying in the fight that is like a to me kind of a glorious fight of this tension of pulling away and coming closer and pulling away and coming closer that's really what makes a marriage but yeah I'm aware there's you're all there's always going to be a woman out there that's thinner more beautiful has better hair whatever I'm not in competition with any other women I'm just not and I'm not intimidated by the beauty of another woman. I am occasionally jealous of other people's wardrobes. I'll be really honest with you. <laughs> I do love beautiful clothes. But I don't want anyone else's man. And I don't care if someone else wants my man because he's mine. And this is a, this is a relationship that has grown and shown the test of time. And been, it been confronted with everything it could be confronted with. And we have overcome all of those things. And so now it's stronger than ever. So I really don't, like, you could flood my house with a million beautiful women. I would just be like, could you please get out of my way? Because I need to get to my to my man. And I don't, I don't really, like, care. Like, if when he comes home and tells me, I had a conversation with blah, blah, blah. Jeez, his wife was really beautiful. I was like, really? Like, to me, it's just a description of the fact that he had lunch with this man and his wife was beautiful. I was like, oh, would I like them? He's like, yeah, you'd really like them. They're really awesome. Like, ne never in my head am I like, would you rather be with her? Because I'm like, you'd be stupid if you would rather be with her. <laughs> like, Good point. I mean, if you really want to blow, if you really want to blow this up, I mean, you're an idiot. So I'm not going to try and talk you out of it. Like, good luck. On that note, let's take a P&T. <laughs> and honestly, guys, I want you to hear this. You can ask us anything you want. And, and and you don't need to agree with anything that we're saying. I I just want it for you, right? So think about any good questions, and let's just come back and have a question and answer time and, and keep going. Amen? All right. Told you. Wait, there's, is there a performance happening? Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining class. There's a performance.